Hey, everybody. So, uh, the DM and one of the players got into a fight because the DM and his infinite wisdom decided to skip session zero where there would be an exploding baby in session one. And one of the players, as we found out, was really averse to the ideas of babies going nuclear. And when I mean nuclear, I mean like, like mushroom cloud, like atomic breath, like nuclear. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, they took umbrage to that. So, uh, the DM and session are canceled. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, I'm now imagining a man holding up a baby and then pulling a pin on the baby like a grenade and just throwing it and it glowing <laughs> just, as it flies <laughs> through the air. <laughs> just Rafiki the baby. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, <laughs> a baby. <laughs> but I, I specifically That's imagine good. it having the like Godzilla atomic glow where like it starts kind of dim and then gets brighter and brighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it does like the. <laughs> <laughs> and just a nuclear fission event goes up <laughs> within the baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? Fantastic. But anyway, welcome back to the Sessions Cancelled podcast, where me and Josh uh, and some other chuckle fucks potentially uh, talk shit about random things that pop into our heads and maybe like topical subjects like uh, whatever nonsense Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro are trying to pull today. Or is Games Workshop actually canceled? I don't, I don't you know, think they did. Things. I don't think Wizards or Hasbro did anything crazy this past week. So, you know. No, they did. They did. did they they oh fucking removed the stupid. Oh, you're right. Thing. We talked oh, about this on Friday. Oh my god, you're right. Oh my god, Wizards, you fucked it up. I. Uh, that's de- here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is not what. This is not our main topic here. But I just want to just very quickly on this because, god damn it, um, they. They definitely, like, took that out because they were like, well, nobody's using it type thing, right? Like, I'm almost certain that it was a, it's an underutilized feature, so we're not going to keep it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things, it's like, yeah, it's it's an underutilized feature, but you guys really need to score some brownie points these days. And just fucking leave it in for the brownie points, my guy. Like, come on. Like, you're probably. Yeah, yeah I know it, you probably like, lost a little bit of money on that feature or whatever. But like, seriously, Jesus Christ, dude. Crazy. Yep. That being said, Vecna's in Dead by Daylight. That happened today. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, saw that. So, you know, that's. Of course, it's fucking Matt Mercer, too. Like, <laughs> oh, is he voicing Vecna? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't notice that. That's very funny, though. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How do you feel? Side note, again, again, this is not the topic. How do you feel about Vecna's 5e design? Are you into it? The actual art? Yeah. No, he looks sick. Um, I just wish, like, the hand of Vecna does not look like, like a like desiccated an- hand that was amputated and put back on. It just looks like a cool glittery gauntlet thing. So it I, actually, it looks like the witch blade. <laughs> it does kind of look like the witch blade. I don't think that gauntlet is supposed to be the hand of Vecna. I believe that gauntlet is supposed to be what he replaced the hand with. Um, I think don't I that might be wrong, but I think that's the because vi- that's the vibe it's giving me. No, that's so, fair. That's absolutely fair. The one thing I will say is the uh, in in the Eve of Ruin adventure, they gave him a crown. I don't like the crown. I don't fuck with that crown. I haven't seen it. Oh, look up the Vecna Eve of Ruin. He's on the cover. There's, the pauldrons are cool, but the crown is not doing it for me. I don't like the crown. But other than that, I like his 5e design quite a lot, especially because some of his older designs were very goofy. Yes, I, I mean, they were. He looked like oh. old man. Oh, yeah, no. The crown's no. not great, right? No. Yeah, the crown don't do it for me. I don't well, know. It, it, like, it fucks with his whole silhouette. It He's does a skinny fuck with bone his, man. It does fuck with his you silhouette, added a right. bunch of bits onto him. It removes skinny bone man. He looks thicker now, and he shouldn't. I th- Again, I, do th- I think the shoulder pads mostly work, but the crown itself feels off. You know? It's the whole cowl. It's like it makes his neck look really big, you know. Yeah, not it. I'll give you the pauldrons, though. I like that they're actual blades. Like, they're not right. 
Yeah. They're not just big pauldrons. They're straight up axe blades that yeah, are yeah. bolted to his shoulders. That's pretty funny. It's got a, it's got an energy to it. Anyway. <laughs> Neither of the none of that shit we just said is our topic, but it was just that was kind of funny. No, no. Uh, our topic for today, actually, uh, and it's it, it's topical for me specifically because I'm starting a new campaign in uh, two weeks and counting, is we're going to talk about Session Zero, that thing that literally every other YouTuber or role-playing game podcast has ever talked about, but now we're going to do it because fuck you, I want to. And I'm starting a new game. Did we not do a Session Zero? No, I don't think we did. Like, we never did a Session Zero episode at all. Like, like purely focused on Session Zero? I'm pretty sure we didn't. Okay. I I, I, mean, I believe you. I, I didn't just... think about it enough. Hold on. I'm checking. I'm going to check our YouTube channel. Right if we did, then uh, this is a revisit. Uh, podcast. Uh-huh. Session. Uh-huh. Zero. Mm-hmm. I'm about to feel real dumb. I, I. Nope. Nope. We're good. We're good. Whew. Okay. All right. Awesome. I felt like we did, so that's that's interesting. Uh, that being said, I looked up Session Zero, and there's a million and one episodes on different podcasts about Session Zero. So, like I said, we're, we're retreading about ten year old ground here. But still, I mean, fuck you, I do what I want. You know, it's one of those things that everybody talks about, but it does. It, like everybody talks about it, but it feels like it's one of those things that everybody should talk about. So it's okay, you know what I mean? Like, yes, and it, it is one of those things where genuinely there is no real right answer to this question. We'll talk about this later. There's no right answer. Like n- No, yeah. There really people is. will like to tell you that there is a firm, correct answer on Session Zero and how to do Session Zero and what goes into Session Zero. Yeah. Uh, spoiler for the next hour and a half. There isn't. There isn't, and anyone who tries to tell you is just kind of huffing their own bias. Um, that being it, said, yeah, as you it, will find out. It feels like people get a little like gatekeepy on what session zero is and or should correct um but well, we're gonna get into that soon but first josh tell them about our links our links well you can find my only fans in the description um you can Damn, i don't even have that <laughs> you know i don't think i could run an only fans but it'd be funny if i tried um what was I? Shit. Uh, 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 follow or subscribe. Hit the follow or subscribe button. What you're listening. What? What you're lit. Hit the. F- yeah. What? Mm-hmm. Hit the follow or subscribe button on your podcast platform of choice. We're just going to pretend like I didn't fuck that up for a minute there. You got it. You got it, bud. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> I'd, call back, that, I'd call that a smooth recovery. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Please take but me yeah, away from this. So we're t- we're talking about session zero. Um, we'll start with the top of my notes, which is for literally any of you hiding under a rock, like purposefully and not just living under there like Patrick. Like you were like, no, fuck the government. I'm going under a rock. Uh, fuck the government. Session zero. <laughs> basic <laughs> description. Session zero in, in the most basic terms is a pseudo session held before the official commencement of a campaign or, or whatever tabletop RPG thing that you're doing. Um, and its whole point is to discuss a number of topics that the players should or may want to know um, and up to having like a level of input in and, you know, zero because it's before session one. Um, it is the only real time where players and a GM are on perfectly even grounds. Because it's it's a kind of like a negotiatory period, really. Um, it, yeah, it's the uh, and, it's the negotiation business meeting before you decide your two companies are going to go into business together. Yeah, it, it is. It is the literal like trade offer meme. Yes. Yeah, it is actually um, the trade offer meme. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trade trade offer. I want to play homebrew race. You get interesting character concept for story. <laughs> <laughs> Tra- trade offer. I will power game and destroy your <laughs> your sense of balance. You will give me D and D. I that. That's not a good trade, Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> but that is how it often goes. <laughs> that is how it often goes. That's a horrible trade. Don't accept. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I will say, I think one other important thing to note that 
at, at least for me, I don't know, at least for my definition of session zero, part of the reason it's called session zero is because you don't actually play the game in session zero. It's the prep, preparatory, prep, preparation, preparatory. preparatory. That doesn't feel right. It's the preparation session. So you don't actually play the game in session zero. I think that that for me is an important distinction. Maybe other people don't find that to be an important distinction. But I think of that as one of the kind of key factors. Okay. Some people would actually disagree with you on that one. I bring that up later on. Okay. Well, there, there you go. Um, it, yeah, it, it does, among other things, to, to not, you know, to stop giving like generalizations. Uh, it gives players insight to what they're going to be experiencing over the course of the game. Um, it allows them to sort of give the GM some hard or soft things to avoid. Um, allows them to ask questions about the setting in a more generalized way that other people can hear and have input on, um, you know, up to including giving players information that they might want to know. So maybe they could have like pre-established bonds at the start of session, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, side note what is typically discussed. I, I, yep. I just I just want to point out I just want to point out for everybody listening Isaiah was feeling very very prepared today he he wrote so many notes he's like he came to class prepared crazy I did I wrote all my notes while I was getting my tires replaced he today. wrote the notes <laughs> the and, auto body shop and, nice and they're relatively organized everything is crazy like I'm proud of myself um what is typically discussed like I said general themes what the game's about if you're playing in D and D what's the setting. What are the genres? Because D and D, despite being heroic power fantasy, does have quite a few genres. You know, like uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist is like a noir kind of murder mist or, or bank heist. Um, Curse of Strahd is supposed to be a survival horror, except when Sam is the DM, in which case it becomes weird isekai shonen where you become friends with Strahd at the end. <laughs> um. I mean, honestly, Descent into Avernus I, is supposed <laughs> to be D and D's take on Warhammer 40k, and, until Sam runs it, in which case you run into Shen Duel at the base of a tower, and it becomes wacky woohoo fun times. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest. The uh, the Curse of Strahd one is supposed to be survival horror for a lot of people. I don't think it ends up in that place for many games. No, it's survival horror until you get to old Bone Grinder, and then it's meme town, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. If the internet has told me anything about Curse of Strahd is that people love the idea of the vibe of that Curse of Strahd is supposed to be, but nobody actually plays Curse of Strahd that way. It just never... No, I, I or think, they try and it doesn't work. Yeah, no. Okay, so th this is how you, like, how do you get Curse of Strahd to play the way Curse of Strahd's supposed to feel? You get Vampire the Masquerade characters to play Curse of Strahd. Yeah, yeah. Because if you get D and D characters play Curse of Strahd, it will devolve into wacky woohoo yeah. fun times. You actually just play Vampire the Masquerade five E instead of D and D five E, and then your problem is solved. <laughs> That's how you yeah, do that. You pretty much got it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If you are not playing D and D, that being said, you know, maybe the players read the rule book but skipped some of the like most of the flavor text. Like I'm sure my Lancer players will. I'm sure they will. Don't worry. I know. I know all of you. I love you all, but I know you're going to skip most of the lore. Um, that gives them a chance to ask you questions like, hey, GM, what's an NHP? And you're like, that, that thing that you mark down on your character sheet, that thing that says NHP specialist, the thing that you're supposed to be good at, that NHP? And they go, yeah, what is that? And you're like, mm, mm-hmm, okay. Listen, many people ignore the lore of tabletop games. I, myself, often included, and I don't really blame people because given the, listen, even if your tabletop game has amazing lore and is very interesting, like a lot of people, I would argue Vampire the Masquerade has very interesting and good lore. The medium itself is an incredibly bad lore delivery system because the whole point of tabletop games is that you are in control and that you could do whatever the fuck you want so you can ignore or pay attention to lore as much or as little as you please so the whole medium is just a really bad way to convey any kind of lore or setting stuff because the players can just toss it out at a whim. So I don't really blame people. I get it. I yeah. get it. No, like I don't blame them. It just makes me sad, though. 
Yeah, well, it makes you sad um, when you're invested in the lore of the game and somebody else. It's like I remember, like when I was running Blades, I think the setting for Blades is pretty cool, but like half our players were not that about it. And I was like, well, it's fine, I guess. <laughs> you know, like jokes on them. I read that bitch front to back. <laughs> I know you did, but the, some of my other players didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I do think Brett, so I, you didn't read that book. I bet money. On it. I think Brett did read a couple of things because I remember Brett referenced little bits and pieces of the lore, but I don't think he went like all the way in. I, you know, I, even if he did, I'm still going to call him out for not doing it. I'm going to put it out into the universe that's so fair. he can combat me in his edit. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Um, I, and that way we'll get a clip out of it. <laughs> I will say. I, I, there's a part of me that's thought about how you could have a, a role-playing game where the lore delivery is handled in such a way that people get really invested in it. And I think the best way to do it is kind of like a, a show don't tell method. And what I mean is you have very minimal lore stuff in your core rule book. And then the way you deliver the lore is shadow of the demon Lord actually got me to think about this because it sort of kind of does this where you have very minimal lore and then you deliver all of the the more expounded lore stuff via adventures so the players learn the lore by playing the adventures and that's how you get invested in it like you know similar to how like a video game does it you know you're thrust into the world and you're interacting with the world so that's what makes you care i feel like there's an untapped well of potential there for role-playing games and I haven't seen anyone. No, do it I agree. Uh, like, but yeah, you know. I, I, honestly, I think if you had like Lancer does this a little bit, right? You have like the comp con that has like, you know, it's a dossier style thing. So while you're playing the game, you can be like, oh, a well, Barbarossa shows up and you're like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. 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 Like, oh, it's that thing. And then it's like it's it's literal like stat block has lore built into it. And you're like apocalypse rail. Can't what the? Oh, that's of course, real bad. Of course, <laughs> then you get into the awkward position of, as a player, you shouldn't be looking up, like, monster stat blocks. So then it's like, oh, how much of this do I read and stuff? But, yeah, there's potential there, for sure. There's definitely potential. Oh, that's the best part about Lancer, is that the you can't actually get monster stats by looking at the, like, player-facing stuff. Um, because you just have general archetypes that you can staple abilities onto from the player side stuff so you know if, if i'm like oh yeah you see a barbarossa they can be like oh i know it's got the giant gun on its fucking forehead great <laughs> that's right. pretty much all they'll be able to use right yeah, um that's yeah um and then yeah you know, d- back to the topic the the you know a big thing that i think needs to be discussed a lot and i've, I've dealt with this is discussion of like mood and overarching theme of the game. I feel yeah. like this is one of those few things that I say is absolutely mandatory to Session Zero because if, it, like Curse of Strahd, if you go in as the DM and be like, I'm going to get such, like, if you came from Vampire the Masquerade and you're like, I'm going to get such good melodrama out of this, it is going to be mwah, chef's kiss level drama. And then it, it turns into meme town because you have a gnome with a Hawaiian shirt that shoves a crystal up his ass. Session one, <laughs> it's going to end in weird times for you. Uh, the players are going to love it, but you are going to feel kind of weirdly Ludo narrative disco biscuits about it. Um, just to so be, yeah, that's, just that's to be entirely of, clear, because I think we need to mention that that wasn't a that was not a reference Isaiah pulled out of his ass. That happened in our Curse of Strahd game. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Nelson the gnome. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. That literally yeah. happened. That wasn't out of the blue. Um. Yeah. yeah that was a thing. I. I. I think. Yeah. I. I. I <laughs> the thing about the thing I think is really funny about the idea of discussing the theme and tone. Right. Is it if you were to go see a movie, like you're 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 hanging out with your buddy or your girlfriend or something, and you're trying to explain, you know we're going to go see this movie. And then the person you're going with goes, okay, well, what kind of movie is it? Right. You're not going to say like, don't worry about it, chief. You'll find out when we get there. Right. Most of the time you're going to be like, oh, like it's an action movie or, oh, it's like, it's kind of a suspense thriller thing. Or, oh, it's like a James Bond mission impossible kind of thing. You know, you give them like a vague description. So they have an idea of what they're going into. And the reason you do that isn't, is not because, 
It's not because they can't watch the movie without that information. Obviously, you can watch a movie without having any information about what it is. The reason you do that is because when you're told a, like generally what kind of genre you're dealing with, you have a certain expectation set up and having the correct expectation for the correct thing can make the experience more enjoyable. So, you know, actually movies are maybe not even the, be the best example. It's probably better to say video games, right? If I'm going into a video game and I go, what kind of game in this is this? And somebody tells me it's a first person shooter. I have a certain expectation for what the vibe of the game is. If I'm expecting a puzzle platformer and then it turns out to be a first person shooter, I'm going to be mad even if the game's good because I thought it was one thing and it turns out to be another thing. And now I'm annoyed because I wanted to play a first person shooter, but this is a fucking puzzle platformer. Why did nobody tell me it was a puzzle platformer, right? RPGs are much the same. It's more enjoyable if somebody says, what kind of campaign are we doing? Oh, big, epic, heroic, multiversal, travel the dimensions, fantasy. Oh, okay, I got the vibe. Or dour, kind of spooky, a little bit of horror style, you know, a la Curse of Strahd. Oh, okay, now I know what the vibe is. It makes it more enjoyable. Like, it's not necessarily mandatory in the sense that you can literally, you can literally play the game without this information but it's mandatory in the sense that you will have a better time if you know this information like it helps mm -hmm. it's very important and if if you want i could take this into the into the kinky second sex analogy because i do it all the time but i won't but i could <laughs> well but, like here's the thing if you if you invite the missus or mr over for a night of fun and then you punch them in the face without explaining anything it's yeah. going to be a kind of awkward conversation. Right. Exactly. <laughs> if you pull out the whip and they were not ready for the whip, it's not a good time. But if you inform them about the whip, then they can prepare. Yeah, look, exactly. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it's um, it's uh, uh, I, yeah, like expectation setting can can help uh, sort of um. Wow, I really... Words are escaping me right now. Ha, like, help set the tone, and setting the tone can then make it more fun because you know what to expect. Yeah, like, there's a... There's, a, there's like, a proven psychology of the... It's, it, it's literally the reason that trailers for movies often spoil big stuff in the movie because... When they spoil big stuff in the movie, you feel like the movie is now a safer bet because you have your expectations set. So you know what to expect. And so now you feel more inclined to go into it. You know what I mean? It's it's literally that effect. Have you have I ever told you the story about um, when expectations absolutely gave me uh, it like took years off of my life? For, for a tabletop game? For a video game. No, I don't think so. Okay. So th those of you who are at a, at a at a computer, look up the game Gone Home. Um, wait, 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 which game? Like Gone Home. Oh, Gone Home. Yes. Okay. Yes, I do know this game. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Oh, this is one I of the. Oh, know. Okay, wait. This is one of the OG walking simulators back when those were popping. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it was yeah. amazing. However, I thought it was a horror game going in. Because yes, everything yes, about yes. its fucking advertising made yes. it look horrifying. Yeah, that yeah. game's like three hours long if you're slow, which I was, because I thought it was a horror game. That was the most horrifying three-hour experience of my life, genuinely. Because yeah. I didn't, I was like, something is going to scare the shit out of yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, you this were... is going to get really dark at some point. And then it didn't. And like... And I was like, I was like, oh, this is super nice. She's talking about this girl she fell in love with. Oh, like, I can't. I, I I'm so. I'm, this is gonna suck when it goes horribly wrong, and you find out one of them was like died horribly. No, no, no I didn't. No, they just. They, she would like the whole. Game, I think she like. She goes back home to tell her family that she moved out, and the people her her family's not there because they just went out shopping. That was it. They were just. Oh no, they went out to like a restaurant or something and didn't expect her to get home. They were they were fine. They were alive. They just were literally out of the house and she got home early. That was the whole that was the whole thing. And I was like at the end literally like what's that the the like 
the picture of the the dude where he's like breathing out and he's got his hand on the table like like he's like exhaling that was me yeah yeah <laughs> you 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 were waiting for the other shoe to drop so much that you you put yourself in like an emotional uh like tidal wave and couldn't you couldn't pull back there was no getting yeah, out yeah yeah exactly yeah it, it, i mean that, that doesn't that shit got me yeah that makes sense that doesn't even surprise me yeah shit like that well be and now granted you came out of that you know in in that example you came out of it positively and said oh that game was really all like i like that game a lot you know that was a good time but there's absolutely you know another another universe where you came out of that experience just pissed off because you were so expecting another thing that when it turned out not to be the thing you were expecting, you're just you're just mad about the situation, you know? Like there's yeah. another scenario no, where you is. vehemently hate that game because someone told you it was one thing and it wasn't that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and look, it's a very good thing that I'm like very good at finding silver linings. Yeah. Um well, because it, otherwise it would have been a massive L. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it'd be like if a friend, you know, it'd be like if a friend was like, oh, read this book. Uh, it's really cool. It's about like fucking, you know, magical crusader paladins going to war with demons and angels. And your friend's like, oh, that sounds sick. And then your friend starts reading it and then some really dark shit happens. And your friend's like, bro, why did you? I was not in the right mind space to be reading this. Why did you recommend this to me? What the fuck, dude? <laughs> you're like. Oh, well, that's I thought, literally, you know, that's, <laughs> literally that's every asshole friend who recommended metamorphosis to metamorphosis yes, to somebody. Yes, that's is, you. Yes, that's yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> actually. So it's 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 I I did that a little bit by accident. So oh. I was I, I, I told the missus, I told the girlfriend uh, about Black Company. And, you know, as you know, she's a big fucking book nerd. So she was like, oh, I'm down. So she wanted to read the Black Company. Uh, she started reading it. I forgot that one of the major female characters when the first when they first meet her is very young and gets brutally assaulted. I literally forgot that scene was in the book <laughs> because oh, it had no. been because it had a it had been so long and B it's the kind like it doesn't get brought up again very much after it happens. So I forgot that scene was there. So she got to that point in the story and was like, yeah, I had to stop reading for a little while because that got really dark. And I was like, I'm sorry. I genuinely did not remember that was in there. <laughs> I would have warned you if I remembered, but I 100% did not remember. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that happened to me at one point. I forgot what happened. Um, it could be a thing. Like oh, it, <laughs> it was with Ava. It was with Ava. I oh, remember God. this. Our friend, so you remember our friend um, Warlock, right? Yes, yes. Mike, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So he was like, he, I, I had showed him some sequences from the Ava movies, like with all you know their fancy schmancy new animation and shit, right? And he was like, oh, this is so cool. I'm gonna watch this whole series. And I was like, yeah. Uh, and he was like, he finished the main show, and he was like, that was so good. Oh, uh, what's this like end of Ava? I'm like, oh yeah, that's like the end of the original series that that spirals into the new movies. He's like, oh okay, okay, I'll watch that. And me and then he came back to me and was like so uh was that a hospital thing i was like oh shit. <laughs> no no fun fact no mm. it, it wasn't i don't know yeah. why it was in the movie yeah. but he was like that was like distressing and i was like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. not not ano's proudest moment not not it um, yeah, you know, so I feel that. <laughs> well, and you know, here's the funny thing, right? So stuff like this to, to tie it back to tabletop, you know, this same stuff applies to tabletop where, you know, if you're playing D and D, right? Most people expect tonally expect D and D to be maybe like the Witcher, but a little bit toned down, right? You know, somewhere between like Avatar and the Witcher or something like that. You know, you do, there's some grim, like you're fighting monsters, it gets a little violent, but it doesn't get super dark, right? I think that's most people's sort of base assumption of D&D. &D. Uh, you know, mm. or like uh, Dota, uh, the Dota anime that I can't remember the name of. Dragon's Blood? Dragon's so Blood. So good, by the way. Yeah. 
you know, in that tonal range, right? That's kind of where people are mentally. So if you're pl- sit down to play a D&D game and then, you know, you get uh, Berserk, the eclipse scene. And if you've read Berserk, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not going to describe it. You know, you're going to be like, whoa. It's like the beginning of Black Company, but worse. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty much. much worse. Yes, similar situation to what I was saying in Black Company, but worse. Um, you know, if you get that in your D&D game, you're going to be like, whoa, what the fuck? If you got no warning. The funny thing is, and I don't know if you're on the same page as me or not on this, Isaiah, but. I'm the kind of person where when wild and shit like that happens and I didn't have any warning, I I kind of love it. I'm kind of a sick fuck and I'm like, oh, I kind of love that I was unprepared for this. It, it depends. It, 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 yeah, I like, mean, it does depend. You're right. But like, so actually using Berserk. I didn't know about the I didn't know anything about Berserk when I watched it. I didn't know how crazy Berserk got. So the eclipse scenario, I was like, holy shit, dude, this is crazy. And like, I kind of loved it. So and by I should clarify when I say loved it, I don't yes, mean please. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, because this is going to this is going to sound bad. When I say I love the eclipse scene, I don't mean I like what happened to Casca. Because I don't. She's my favorite character in the whole series. What I mean is I like that the series kind of slapped me in the face and went balls to the walls. I like the ballsiness of the whole thing. I like the author being... I I, I like when the author, the creative person behind the IP, you know, behind the story or whatever, takes things in a heavy direction and just goes for it because they had a certain idea. And it doesn't always land. There are times where it just doesn't land. But when it works, I like the ballsiness of it. The problem is... Yeah, so... It gets into a weird gray area when you're talking about a D&D game because you're hanging out with friends and it's supposed to be, like, a communal chill, we're all hanging out time. So that kind of shock and awe can feel unfair? Yeah, so I, actually, yeah. I'll tell you where, where that happened for me, because I, I did know the Berserk thing was going to happen, so I spent the whole time being like, this is so fucked, bro. Okay, yep. <laughs> um, for me, it's a it's, it's another mecha, so, you know, strap uh-huh, in. Uh-huh. Uh, it's called a Rekka 7. It's probably my favorite mecha of all time. Okay. It is, among its many themes, because, you know, discussing themes is important, is like, perpetuation of life, right? Like, life goes on, much like an ecosystem, things will die and they will move on. And the whole thing with Eureka 7 is that in a lot of ways, the ecosystem has stopped. Like aliens touch down on Earth. This like fungus erupts that destroys the ecosystem. And it forces like this electromagnetic wave into the air that does a lot of crazy things. And in strong, in, th- where it gets heavy is in strong enough density, that electromagnetic wave, among other things, sterilizes people, Ooh. thus stopping the perpetuation of life. So when the main character does his super cool attack and everyone is like, there's just dread in the air across all of his friends. And you're like, but that was so cool. What's wrong with that? And then you find out in the next episode, you're like, oh, no. And it because the, the show kind of it hinted at it, right? The ecosystem has stopped things that can't like entropy is bad, right? Mm hmm. It makes you have this whiplash moment where you're like, oh my god, it all makes sense. Jeez. <laughs> right. You're rubbing your neck. Yeah. So with that, yeah, I really well, like it. Um, I was prepared for right, right. our vampire game to be wacky woohoo fun times with a serious tone. But if we went like dark, I would be all for it. Because like I didn't expect it to happen, but I understood that it was a, a possibility was no matter how small. On the table. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, like... But if it's like the surprise can be good, but the surprise, if it doesn't land right, can really fuck up the whole situation. So it's, yeah, you know, mm. ooh, a topical version, a uh, suicide squad, James Gunn, suicide squad. Dude. You don't know that everyone in the beginning of that movie dies until they start dropping like rocks, but you're like, Oh, well, it's the suicide squad. This makes sense. If it was, mm. you know, um, the Avengers and you know, uh, it, it, it fucking 
Captain America gets his head blown off and you watch his brain right, right. splatter the wall. You're like, oh, I no. I'm trying to think of what's a, what's a, what's an example of where that went poorly. I'm trying to think. Nothing's coming to me. Poorly? Yeah, like where they really went for the crazy, like the sort of shock and awe angle and it just falls really flat and ruins it. Um, like, hmm. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to think. It's because you don't remember the bad examples, right? Like, that's the whole thing. Yeah, pretty much. Well, b- point either way, point being. It, it can be good, but I think think you have to err on the side of not doing it when you're talking about oh, running your I do game. no one. Oh? I do no one. Uh-huh. Naruto. Oh, when, God. It, when you find out that it was all aliens. <laughs> not quite what I was going for, but yeah, that's a pretty bad one. Yeah. Like, it, it, uh, the, the, point I'm, the point I'm trying to get at is that I like that shock and awe crazy stuff, but when it has to feel earned it has to feel earned but i think the more important thing is when you're reading a book or playing a video game or watching a movie you're at the whims of the director the author the the creator whatever when you're playing tabletop you're all working as a group and you're just hanging out with friends so there's not the same expectation of getting slapped in the face because you assume that you're in kind of a not to use the word like I, I hate the phrase safe space, but you're in like a you're in like a bubble of nothing bad is going to happen because I'm hanging out with friends kind of scenario. So it's like the urge to do the shock. I understand, but I think it needs it. it you have to just you have to accept it's not going to work the same in a tabletop game as it does in something like a movie or a book or whatever. I think is, yeah, is kind of what I'm like, at. And session zero is thing, how you set that, set those building blocks up. Yes. I right. Agree. You know, um, like if you say to, if you say in session zero, you know, we're playing D and D, but I'm going to run this D and D campaign like berserk and your players all know berserk. You're setting up those building blocks and they go, okay. Emotional prepping prepping. If you say we're going to play Avatar and then some Berserk style shit happens in the Avatar game, everyone's going to be like, I I don't know if I'm down for this all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, right? Like, yeah, you, you, you play Avatar The Last Airbender and then a character named Plea gets her head blown right. off and you're like, well, whoa, I <laughs> mean, here's the thing. You joke, but like the reason that scene is fucking shocking is because within the Avatar universe, that was out of pocket as shit. <laughs> Right, like, yeah, that scene. I, think, I don't crazy. think there's a single person who didn't look at that scene and was like, "That was fucking brutal." I mean, it was, <laughs> yeah, like it was a. I distinctly, I will never forget. I will never for, and and let's. I'm gonna be honest. Last Airbender doesn't have a scene like this. I will never forget watching Korra and getting to the scene where Plea dies, and I literally, sla- I'm watching on my computer. I slapped, slapped my space bar and pushed myself away from my computer desk (laughs) because I was fucking flabbergasted. I was like, that was great. Like, I literally paused and stopped watching. I put the whole thing on pause because I was like, holy shit, that was crazy. I was so unprepared. I I, I can tell you exactly where I am, where I was. Um, I was I was watching it in my living room and my whole family, like me and my me and my my I have two sets of brothers, um, siblings, whatever. The one younger than me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, we were watching it, and my other younger my other younger brother was playing video games, and my mom was on the far side of the living room reading a book, and because I was streaming it to the TV, I saw it happen, and I literally was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, just going crazy. Yeah. I scared the shit out of everybody in the room. And it, yeah, well, not everyone except my brother Didilo, and we were freaking the fuck out. Yeah. And my mom was like, "What? It's just a cartoon." And we were like, "Pause." No, pause. Watch this. No, pause. Yeah. <laughs> and she even even she was like, "Damn." And yeah. I was like, <laughs> "I think I think the I think the thing that really makes that scene hit too is the and and actually actually 
this might be really good um, inspiration for when you're running a game. I think the scene, the thing that makes that scene hit really good is this, the, the moment itself when Plea dies is wild and you're like, whoa, that was like unexpected for the style of story that we're dealing with because Avatar is more or less still a kid's cartoon and kids meaning like, you know, it, Avatar is roughly targeted at like 13 to 14 year old. Roughly, that's kind of their age they're hitting. Korra may be a little bit older, but still in that range. But the thing that really makes that scene hit is it it, it happens. And then the aftermath of the scene, all of the characters react in in a in a way that's heavy and feels like. Um. Not 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 necessarily respectful, but like we're we're sort of we're honoring, we're paying attention to the crazy thing that just happened. You know, it's not like this character yeah. dies in a crazy way and then they just move on. Like the character dies and then the character's lover like loses his shit immediately after she dies. And then even the people around the situation who were fighting the character, like the character who dies is a bad guy. All of the main characters who are fighting this bad guy they all take a moment to go like, God, oh shit, that was a that was a lot. Like, there's a pause, there's a there's a there's a moment of of paying attention. There's it's a not, break in the action, yeah. Yeah, and it's not even super long. Like, it's only you know, it's like a couple of seconds or whatever. But it's enough of a break. It's enough of a honoring the situation that it it lets you feel the heaviness of it. And you know, it's it's. It's pretty easy to do that in your D&D game where if you do a crazy scene like that, you can you can have that moment of of uh, honoring and paying attention because, you know, as the GM, you can just put the action on pause. You can do that whenever you want, you know, nothing stopping you. So if you do want to do a scene like that, that's going to take people off guard. That's probably a good way to. uh not lessen the blow, but to uh, to mediate decompress. The not even decompress, yeah. but to just mediate how the flow of the scene. Like that's a good way to mediate it. Is like take that pause, pay attention to it, sort of honor the idea of what happened. Like don't just skip over it, kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, uh. Where are we at in the notes situation? <laughs> well, so the good thing is that we covered the one after ne after theme content warnings, if any. Uh -huh. Yeah, pretty much yeah. all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, discuss any particularly heavy topics that are kind of come up. You don't have to tell them exactly what's going to happen. Um, information on how the characters can speak up if they feel uncomfortable with the situation. And there, we have a whole episode on safety tools. Uh, we do actually. Whole discussion. We did talk about safety tools. Do you need them? Tools. Do you not need them? This, this, that, the other. That's funny. Not maybe, important for this. Maybe that's why I thought we talked about session zeros because we talked about the safety tools thing. True, and that was also me too. Funny. Yeah. Um. Um. I will say too. Another thing is in terms of setting up expectation, like the the kind of stuff that's going to happen in your game. A, I think a really good way to set up that expectation is to use other media as reference. So, like I said. Uh, we're playing D and D, but I'm gonna run this campaign in the tone of Berserk, or in the tone of The Witcher, in the tone of Avatar. Those all set a certain expectation, and if your players know what that is, they'll have a certain idea. Or we're gonna play this game, and I'm gonna run it kind of in the vibe of Star Wars. You know, using popular stuff to set that mental barometer of like, okay, this is what I can expect. When you're watching Star Wars, you don't expect to see a, a character get like brutally decapitated in a gruesome explosion of viscera and blood. So when somebody says, I'm going to run this in the tone of Star Wars, you're like, OK, so we're not going to like describe how we saw a man's head off with our fucking meat cleaver or whatever, because that's not mm. within the tone. So using using whatever kind of media or pop culture stuff that your care, your not your characters that your players are familiar with, uh, helps set that whole situation up. Yes. I've, I've done it several times. It works. It works. It does. Yes. <laughs> um, especially when the, when the characters aren't like a hundred percent, like they don't, exactly know what tropes you're pulling from but they can sort of recognize it as a cliche and you're like they're like oh right. 
oh, this is a scripted event. Oh, no. Oh, this is going to be so bad. And you're like, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Street Fighter Bison. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, after that, you get rules clarifications. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what what rules are you keeping as the DM? What rules are you changing as the DM? And how do those rules changes affect the players, right? If you do, you know, uh, you know, bringing up Lancer, Lancer doesn't have money, rules is written, except for that, like, one supplement they added. Uh, so the players, if they only read the core rules, will go, oh, well, I don't have to, like, worry about money because there isn't any money. But I, as the person who's going to be running Lancer, have to, and they're going to know about this because they're probably going to watch this episode. Yes, money will be a factor. Uh, it will affect you. A lot of your characters, as you've told me, worry about money because you're mercenary. So that's going to be a thing that you're going to have to think about and contend with. Um, and what homebrew, if you're using any, is, I mean, technically homebrew, uh, home rules, you are homebrewing, but like, I mean, homebrew, homebrew in the more generic sense, you know, if you're like, oh, well, we, you know, rules is written, you know, the, like all of the supplement books, but I'm also allowing Mercer Gunslinger, you know what I mean? Like. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. What third, or, you know, what Blood third Hunter party or stuff are you allowing to be uh, on the table, more or less? Yes. As and, well as what, this is what not, homebrew rules are you conjuring up yourself? Yes. Uh, this is not just GM facing. This is also player facing. If players are like, "Hey, I have a cool idea for this feat that I want to use that makes whips actually a thing that you can do in Five E." Can yeah. I use this feat? And then they, uh, I toss me. Mm, all right, sure, why not? You know what I mean? Or no. Um, stuff like that. And th this is something that I, that, so Josh had said earlier that you don't like, or that, no, Josh had brought it up and I had sort of responded to it. The last thing that you usually get in, in sessions, you know, are character introductions, right? This does not have to take the form of actual gameplay or role play, but it's just you describing your character, um, and, you know, getting some information from the GM about world lore, stuff like that. So you can further flesh them out and have them ready and, you know, got the spinning rims for session one. It's also where typically, if it's not done in character creation, where players will establish, establish, <laughs> establish uh, pre-existing bonds. Are you, are our characters family? Are they friends? Maybe we were exes, maybe we're rivals, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, character, I, the character introduction thing, I feel like. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm getting on a little bit of a pedestal here, but a lot of people talk about the session zero stuff and a lot of people bring up all the stuff we just mentioned. You know, what's the tone of your game? What the what can the players expect? Are there any heavy topics that your players don't want to have in the game? Is there any stuff that they might feel uncomfortable about? Is there any, uh, you know, is there certain things in the game that you want to warn the players about, right? Uh, people will bring all that stuff up on a pretty regular basis. I don't feel like people talk about the character introduction and tying the characters in stuff enough. Like, it feels like this is a little bit of an underserved point in that something that I think will make your game exponentially better a lot of role-playing games have this built in, but a lot don't. Is that setting up your characters, like you as a player, set up your character to be tied into the setting, tied into the adventure, tied into the world right from the jump because you will feel more invested. You will have a better time if you feel like your character is really connected to what's going on. Because, so like in a, an example, everybody take a shot. In Apocalypse World, your characters have a stat, a literal mechanical stat called history, shortened to HX. Your history is a representation of how well or not well you know the other player characters. And it can go from uh, everywhere from minus four, it goes from minus four to plus four, and it's a sliding scale. And if you're up to, you know, from zero to plus four means you know a character well, and from zero to minus four means you don't know a character very well. 
Uh, but the idea is that you have a history with them. So, for example, uh, I think it was the Brainer in uh, First Edition Apocalypse World. Everybody goes around and does this thing called their history questions at the beginning of the game, or at the begin, or before the game starts. You do your history questions, as to say, not the beginning of the game. Um, and the Brainer has a thing where regardless of what everyone's history is with you automatically deduct it by minus one because the brainer is weird and uh sort of reclusive as a character so you automatically don't know them as well as you think you do so even if a player is like i know you really well because of x y and z thing i get a plus two the brainer character goes yeah, yeah you get a plus two but subtract one from that plus two because i'm a weird reclusive like i'm a reclusive weirdo you don't get to know me that well so yeah it's it, you un, you know me but you don't understand yeah you like, think you know me but you not know as that, well that my yeah you know my tragic backstory but you don't actually know that well how it affects me because i'm a weirdo yeah i'm a weirdo i don't talk about myself very much so you don't think you don't know me as well as you think you do and so what that does is establishes this idea that all of the first of all all of the player characters know each other in some capacity they might all hate each other but they know each other it could be good it could be bad it doesn't matter they know each other the other thing it establishes though is it's a mechanical backbone to represent we have a history before the game we know each other and that mechanical backbone then can influence our interactions with each other because when you help or interfere with another player character you roll with your hex bonus so if you have a plus four with somebody and you try to help them, you're really good at helping that person because you know them very well. But if you try to interfere with that person, it's actually a negative because you know them well. It, it, it becomes this sort of awkward relationship with them or or is it, shit. Wait, no, I might be misremembering the mechanic. It might be. No, sorry. Ah, crap. Now I can't remember. But point being that stat. I, I might I think I'm confusing the mechanic it has been a while since I've looked at it. but the idea is that history number affects the role when it comes to helping or interfering with a person with another player character <clears throat> that's all built into the game right and so all of that forces you to establish this interconnectedness between the player characters because the game says you literally have to you can't play without having this but games like D&D or Pathfinder, Shadowrun, fucking, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe even Lancer. I forget. I don't think Lancer has any kind of like uh, connection stat. Um, a lot of other games. Yes, it has the bonds. It has the bonds. Did they do anything mechanically, though? I don't remember. I, no, I believe right? so. I believe it lets you add things to triggers. Does it? Oh, okay, that's good. Point being, not all games have this. So... If you're, the game doesn't have something mechanically backing this concept, you should still try to address it in session zero because it, it will just it just makes the game better. And this doesn't mean that all the characters have to be friends. You can play a D&D game where the entire party fucking hate each other. But the point is, is that the party has a history. They know something about each other. There's a there's a there's a connection there that ties them together and ties them to the overall adventure, right? Like you want to have, cause here's the thing. You could have a campaign where you're like, all right, guys, the premise of this campaign is we're in Barovia and we're going to fight Strahd. And then one of the player characters goes, yeah, 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 that's all well and good. Um, GM, I'd like to play a GIF Yankee from Wild Space who's never been to this dimension a day in their life and doesn't even know who the fuck Strahd is and doesn't give a shit about the planet uh, about the planet that Faerun exists on at all. Doesn't care. I'm just kind of here. <laughs> you can do that, but like it's not going to be as fun as it would be if you had a character who's like connected to the root to the world of Faerun or connected to Barovia or a character who knows who Strahd is it's just you're just gonna have a better time if your character is connected to the situation or at the bare minimum gives a shit about the situation right like 
when we played Descent into Avernus, my character Zigzags didn't necessarily have a connection to what was going on in Avernus, which is the whole like, oh, El Terrell got pulled into hell and we need to go save it and Zariel needs to be redeemed and all this shit. My character wasn't connected, but he cared about the situation because he had this urge to be an awesome hero and write a cool story about himself. So he was like, this is my opportunity. So you just, you need to, at the bare minimum, care, you know? Yeah. You know, because like, if, if you, I would just say real quick, yeah. if you are so inclined to not do that, um, if you want to make that gift Yankee from wild space. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole, like they don't have, to, they still have to care at the end of the day. They still have to care. Right. The or, thing that makes people like Lazelle is because she is an outsider. She's literally not sure what's going on at any given moment, but she's trying to figure it out through her own lens and perspective. Right? Well, she's and, attached to the situation. Well, she doesn't want to be there. She but she's attached there because she has to be, and she engages with it because she has to be. Well, she, the the other thing that's really important about Lazelle in particular is yes, she doesn't want to be there, and she fucking hates the situation she's in. But she's attached to the situation because the Mind Flayer tadpole, which is the thing that connects all the characters, forces her to have to be invested in this situation because if she is, if she ignores it. She's like, I'm going to die and turn into a mind flare. And that's fucking awful. So I have to work with these idiots to try and fix this problem. I have no choice. So you could make a character like that. Who's like, I don't want to be here, but you know, for X, Y, and Z reason, I have to, that works too. Or the other possible option is you play the Gith Yankee from wild space who doesn't give a flying fuck about anything that's going on. But that character's entire personality is fuck it, we ball. That works too, right? Like, it does, yes. Maybe the character doesn't care, but everything that comes up, he goes, well, sure, why not? Let's do it. Let's see what happens. And if you do that, yeah, it, that's a reasonable <laughs> option. <laughs> yeah, if your Gith Yankee is just super into fighting and you're like, well, there's this super powerful uh, vampire yeah. that's in that castle way down over there. Oh, I'm going to probably be a good fight. And the Gith Yankee's like, let's do it. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go. <laughs> I, I don't care. I didn't give a shit about any of this, but now I'm fucking let's go. There's a dude in there and I'm kicking his ass and taking his pancakes. We're going. <laughs> yeah, it's it's you need to have something that sort of connects you into the scenario, even if it's a loose connection. It just needs to be something it just needs to be a thread that you or your GM can pull on is really all it is at the end of the day. Like it needs to be something you could tease out and do more with because everybody thinks it'll be really fun to play, you know, Strider, the guy who's just kind of there creeping in the corner and doesn't want to talk to anyone and won't mention his edgy backstory and all this shit. Everybody thinks that's going to be a really fun idea, but what you realize is if you don't make your connect, if you don't establish your character's connection to the scenario or the other player characters in session zero, nobody's going to ask you about your backstory. Nobody gives a fuck why you're an edgy loner. Nobody cares what you're doing because why would they? They don't have any reason to ask or give a shit because you didn't give them a reason to ask or give a shit. So you're just never going to get to tell them about your cool fucking edgy backstory about how you're a dark Sith Lord from another dimension or whatever, because they don't give a shit. You didn't give them a reason to give a shit. You know, like you need to there needs to be something, even if it's a crumb, a tiny little crumb. There needs to be something that they could pull on and do something with. And again, it no. doesn't have to be the other players but it could be the GM or the other players or you yourself, but something give yourself, give yourself something to work with because playing the edgy loner, the edgy loner character who doesn't talk about themselves is only cool because they're surrounded by other characters who basically for like, think about all your favorite edgy loner characters. Take a moment audience take a moment and think about your favorite edgy loner characters i guarantee you every single one of them what ended up happening to them 
is that they were surrounded by a bunch of people who forced them to give a shit and stopped letting them be an edgy loney character because they wanted to be friends with that guy or they cared about that guy in some fashion or lady or whatever. Well, I, you know, I was just about to say the thing that I whenever someone wants to run a Strider character is the whole thing with Strider slash Aragorn spoilers um, is that Aragorn cares a lot like yeah at the start. Yeah. In the first 10 minutes, it's about the money. Right. That's, ba- that's about it. That's as far as it goes. Like the first 10 minutes, really. But the second the ring rates get involved and he understands what those things are, he is immediately attached to these goobers because he's like, whatever, doesn't matter what their deal is. They are not prepared for this. I kind of know what's going on. So it is like, I have to help them. Well, and they care about him because he doesn't tell them anything about their backstory. And he tells them as much. My backstory doesn't matter. I am here to help you now. That's yeah. what matters. That's what connects him to the rest of the the, the fellowship is I'm going to help you because you're woefully unprepared and I understand why this is important. You know, and then what happens is, oh, you travel with these people for a long time. Oh, suddenly Aragorn cares about these hobbits because of course he does. He's traveling with them for so long. You know what I mean? Like a, 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 a more recent, exa- not a recent example, but an example I can use right now. I'm rewatching the Avatar series, and I know you just also rewatched the Avatar series. Zuko is Very another good. great example of this, right? Because Zuko's whole thing is he starts as a bad guy, slowly makes his shift into becoming a good guy. But when he becomes a good guy, he's this like, no, I'm too cool. I'm the edgy loner. I'm the disgrace prince, blah, 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 blah. But the rest of the the characters in Team Avatar are like, you don't get to be an edgy loner. We're going to force you to be our friend, whether you like it or not. Right. And the thing that makes Zuko interesting is because his. If Zuko just was the angsty teenager that he is in season one and he never moved past that point. You wouldn't like him as a character. The reason everybody loves Zuko as a character is because he's this angsty teenager that has all this emotional baggage. And then you learn about the emotional baggage and Zuko refuses to deal with the emotional baggage. And then every other character around him is like, no, motherfucker, you have to deal with this emotional baggage. We're not letting you say no. And then finally he caves and is like, "Okay, fine. I'll tell you about my emotional baggage. I guess we'll work on this now because that's what makes it interesting. Like his edgy lonerness is only cool when it's contrasted against where he ends up. So, yes. And I think a big thing about Zuko is that I, I think people forget this is you learn very, very, very early on that Zuko was not always an edgy loner. Like, I think it's like episode like five or six when, when the crew is talking shit about him and, and when Ira was like, well, he wasn't always like this, believe yeah, it or not. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah. And you it's get in those season little one. glimpses of like him when he's happy and he doesn't have his scar and he wants, he's like, you know, this bright eyed kid. And then you care a lot. Cause you're like, Oh God, what happened to you? Yeah. And if you think about it in a D and D context, right? Zuko's connection as the edgy angsty loner guy, when he joins Steve avatar is like, well, I don't really want to talk about my emotions and I don't really like you people that much, but we're going to go fight my dad. And like, that's kind of a lot. So uh, something's going to come up from that because we're fighting my dad. There's no way for that not to turn into something, you know? So mm. Zuko's connection, if you imagine it as a D&D game. Zuko's connection is not with the other player characters. Zuko's connection is with the big bad evil guy. So your connection, your character's connection could be something that isn't necessarily the other player characters. It can be outside the player characters, but it's still connected to the sort of overarching plot, the overarching theme of things. You know, it still goes somewhere because, you know, the fact that Zuko has to go beat up, like, you know, potentially in his mind, kill his dad is like, you know, it's kind of a heavy situation. You know, he still doesn't like Aang very much as a person, but he's still sitting there like, yeah, but I got to help this dude kill my dad. And like, that's kind of a lot, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So it's it. 
There's ways to make it work. You can make the edgy, angsty character. You can do it, but you still gotta gotta get that 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 thread. It's gotta be. There's gotta be something to pull from, because if you're just basically. If you're just Guy McDude who wants to be Edgelord Guy McDude, n- nobody cares. Nobody cares because you didn't give them a reason to care. Why would they care? You know what I mean? Like, nobody gives a shit about a character who just sits there in the corner and sulks all the goddamn time. You know? <laughs> we don't like Sasuke because he's edgy. We like Sasuke because of his connection with Itachi. Right? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Damn, how can you say something so controversial and get so it's old? True. <laughs> it's fucking true. I, it's fucking true. It's fucking, it's true. It's out. It's what it is. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I liked Sasuke in the Zawaza arc. He was cool. <laughs> he was cool, but the thing that emotionally ties you in is his, you know, I say Itachi, but like also the whole Uchiha clan stuff, right? He has this, this mystery, like in the early arcs of Naruto, you're like, What's up with the Uchiha clan stuff? Why is this character a big deal? I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why is he just better than everybody else? Why is he better? Why does he have this weird Sharingan power? Like, before you know what the Sharingan is, you know? Like, why why does he seem so aloof about everything in a way that none of the other characters are? You know, there's stuff there. Mm. Granted, does Naruto stick the landing with Sasuke? Eh! debatable eh, a little up in there but you know yeah debatable i uh, extended material yes the the, the opening Just manga not quite uh, the <laughs> opening the opening premise is there you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah um all of this to bring back to the uh to what we had said at the beginning except not really uh is session zero mandatory basic answer no sort of <laughs> no with an asterisk <laughs> it is ultimately your table right like yeah yeah you're the dungeon master if you want to do session zero do it if you don't want to do it don't do it but understand that there are causes and effects to either of these things uh, and doing session zero not always a net positive not always net negative you know what i mean and i'm not saying there's a situation where session zero can be a bad thing no i'm just saying you gain nothing and lose nothing or sorry you lose nothing by not doing it but there is a lot to gain by doing it. um and you know the universe isn't going to explode if you don't do it. okay um i think i think another way to more phrase- in-depth answer well I, I think another way to phrase that really quickly is is it mandatory no will it greatly enhance your game nine times out of ten yes like it will yeah. get you yeah, a well, better so, game. It, it will get you a better yes. campaign. Yeah, I, I mean, what I meant to say was you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's that's what I yes, meant to say. Yes, that's a yes, um, the, that's a good way to put it. The sort of comes in because again, the only thing I think that it is mandatory is discussing the overall theme and mood of the game. And it, this this is literally yes. to your benefit as the dungeon master yeah. because if your idea of your campaign and the player's idea of your campaign does not match. It's gonna cause friction. It's gonna and suck. It's gonna be frustrating for you. It's gonna suck. And it's only you're the only one who to blame. Um, yeah. The more in depth answer is yes, sort of. Uh, well, like a lot of things when it comes to tabletop, there's a lot of factors that go into the necessity of of session zero, right? In the same way that, like we said in the the safety tools thing, a lot of factors go into whether or not you necessarily should put safety tools in your game. Uh, things like your party size, party familiarity. How well do you know these people as your friends or yeah. not? Yeah, that's right? a big one. Um, and the game in question, if you're playing Sunshine and Rainbows, right? If you're playing like Adventure Quest in mm-hmm. D&D, nothing really, as far as I'm aware, out of pocket happens in Adventure Quest. So yeah, you, you probably don't need to discuss a whole lot. You just kind of tell them like typical action fantasy and they go, oh, bet money i know exactly what to expect now as long as you don't deviate from that their idea and your idea will be the same marvels you know like uh, fucking mcu kind of stuff like yeah but again if you want to have that berserk curveball oh baby better say something about it (laughs) yeah it's um it's like at the bare minimum you should establish the tone and theme but I think it's worth pointing out that establishing that tone and theme could just be a big, long 
a text thread, right? Like you could just, you know, establishing the tone and theme could be as simple as guys, I would like to run a, lo- a game and then here is the style of game I am going to run. And then you just send them a really long message in Discord or whatever, right? Like it could just be a big a forum post, essentially, but it's still something you shouldn't bring your players in a hundred percent blind with the one caveat that maybe if the idea is you're going a hundred percent blind on purpose, like there's a, there's a, uh, there's like a, I don't know, a type of game or a strategy you're trying to employ by having the players go in a hundred percent blind. And it's going to be like a surprise shock and awe, like we're actually doing this, you know, that's the one time that I think you could maybe leave them totally high and dry. But anything short of that, at the very least, give them a very long discord message or text message explaining the basic premise of the campaign at the at the bare minimum. That's the barest minimum. I think you should do more, but if you don't want to do more, at least do that. You know, yeah. if you're running a Wizards of the Coast official adventure, just tell your players the premise of the adventure. That's the bare minimum. Tell them the premise. What's the premise? What's the end goal? Boom, bang, boom. Like, something. You gotta give them something. You can't give them nothing. Like, that's just too crazy. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I've been in a situation where that was the case. Where you got literally let me nothing. Tell you, yeah, and then when the crazy shit started happening and we were all like, this is not what we fucking signed up for. It, it's well, annoying. It's like... For the players and the DM. Even if you take it outside of the Arome... Uh, uh, what? Was that word? Arome? I, I was going to say, <laughs> were you going to say Aroma? I don't know what I was trying to say there. <laughs> even if he's... God damn it. Even if you take it outside of the realm of like establishing a tone, right? Like, oh, the tone of this game is going to be the Witcher. The tone of this game is going to be Avatar. The tone of this game is going to be Dragon Ball Z or whatever. Even if you're not talking about that stuff, telling them the basic premise of the campaign will just give your players ideas for characters at the bare minimum you know like if you're playing in a game where it's like the gods are dead and we are in the darkest times and then the players might go okay so maybe i don't want to play a cleric but if you tell your players absolutely nothing and then your players like all right i want to play a twilight cleric because that sounds cool and then you're like cool all the gods in this universe are dead and clerics don't exist and your players like well you didn't tell me that. I would have made a different character if I knew all the gods were dead and clerics don't exist. I made a Twilight cleric. So, like, what am I supposed to do now? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, from the at the barest minimum, you got to give them something of an idea so they know what kind of characters to fucking make. Uh-huh. You know, because not every character fits every game, nor and quite frankly, every character shouldn't fit every game because that's how you get really generic homogenized characters and generic homogenized characters suck. So, you know, that's a, that's kind of a separate topic rabbit hole though. So I won't go any further down that way, yeah. but yeah. Well, d- don't worry. We're almost at the end. Um, cause yeah. this is the more like opinion based stuff. Um, do you use session zero? I do. Yes. Um, I mean, gosh, obviously. Yeah, does. literally always. I've literally never not used it. Se- so funny thing about like utilizing session zero. When I first started running D&D, which it's been a while now, so I'm not going to assume people have listened to it. But if you go all the way back to episode one, I did talk about this. I first ran D&D. The first ever tabletop thing I did was I ran D&D fourth edition in high school. I knew basically nothing about D&D. My only understanding of D&D came from video games like Final Fantasy. And I knew 
And I don't know why I knew this, by the way. I don't know where this cultural information entered my brain, but I knew for some reason that games like Final Fantasy pulled from D&D as their inspiration. And I was a big Final Fantasy fan when I was in high school. I mean, I still am a big Final Fantasy fan, but I got into Final Fantasy when I was in like high school and I knew that those games pulled from d and I don't know why I knew that, but I do know that. Um, and the idea of like a turn-based RPG, for some reason, I knew that was connected to Dungeons & Dragons. Again, literally no clue how I understood that history. I do not remember, but I did. So, I started playing the game by running d and 4th Edition. I did a Session Zero... Back in, oh Jesus, when did I go to high school? Like 2012? I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't understand what made me think of this, but I did a session zero for my fourth edition game without even know. I don't even think the terminology session zero existed in that time, like in the time frame of 2010 to 2014 i don't even think that phrase existed but i did it anyway because it just seemed like a logical thing to do which is talk to the players discuss what kind of game we're gonna do before we start playing like that just made sense to me so i did it on a reflex i guess or like i did it in instinctively and then Many years later, when I was in college and I got because I played in high school and then I kind of stopped playing for a long time. And then I got back into tabletop in in my like first year of college and I learned that Session Zero was a thing from watching actual plays online and hearing other people talk about it. So, again, I continued to do it. So I've always done it and I just did it instinctively because it just made sense to me. So I've never not done it. There's never been a scenario where I skipped over that step. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Uh, Hilariously, the first ever campaign that I tried running, I also did it without really knowing. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, it just makes sense. I think it's summer. It it does. Yeah. Right. Because like, you know, I told the I told the players we were all hanging out together. I was like, this is what the game is going to be about. Um, and they went, okay, cool. And then the next day I was like, okay, here's the character sheets. Here are the books, everything we need. Yeah. Let's start, let's run a game. And they, they built the characters together. They talked to me about what was going to happen. Like those things just sort of fell into place. And yeah, it just makes sense. It I just, want my players to know what's going to happen at yeah. least a little bit. It feels very, uh, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Because I, people, do sort of skip over that step but to me i'm like ha i don't understand how you could skip over that step because it feels so intrinsic to the entire th- to the entire thing the whole system of it I-, I do kind of understand why people might like some people might not do an entire like a full session zero per se but they are like do a little mini session zero thing before they start playing. I can kind of get how people do it, do that, but doing nothing at all that I don't understand because it just feels correct. It feels very natural to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's funny. I, I I've tried. I, this is kind of a side tangent, but like I've tried to go back and remember where I learned, like, this is this this might be kind of wild i don't even know how i know D, like i do not remember why or how i learned that D exists i don't know how i learned of its existence i don't know how i learned it was a thing i don't know how i had un- any understanding of how D worked i just know that i did isn't that crazy 
Like I've, I, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's probably through things like cartoons, you know, like I it was always, it was referenced think, a lot back in the day, but it was never like, I think it was through a combination of like, yeah, like cartoons and video games and stuff, but I don't know how, because nobody I knew. So my uncle Paul used to play D and D, but he never talked about it to me because he had stopped playing, you know, by the time I was born, he was older, so he didn't really play it anymore. He played video games and stuff a little bit. And he like, I remember him introducing me to Warcraft three, for example, but he never told me about D and D. So I literally do not know where I learned about the existence of D and D. Like I have no memory of where the information entered my brain, but I knew it existed because in high school, I distinctly remember me and Sam talking about D&D and wanting to play it, even though we didn't really understand what it was. We just we thought I think me and Sam both had a similar idea is that it was more like a board game. And that one player was sort of the board game referee and the other players were the board game players. That was how we thought it worked, which was somewhat accurate. But we didn't for E, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well it was yeah, that's the funny thing, right? Is fourth edition it was more accurate even than it was with other editions of D D. But we thought D D worked like, you know, uh, I think me and Sam both had the idea that D D kind of worked like risk, but one of the players is different from the other players. Like that's how kind of the mentality you have. But I don't know where we got the idea from. You know what I mean? Like it's we just knew it. I don't know why. It's cra- it's crazy. I've tried to remember and I have absolutely no clue. I cannot re- like I cannot pull that information from the ethos. It's really weird. I don't know why. I'm pretty sure I learned about D&D in high school because people were I I heard people were playing it and they were getting roasted viciously. See, I that's kinda, the thing. Like, yeah, all right, well, that's the thing I'm going to get bullied for, so I'm just not going to do that thing. And then I got to college and went, nothing matters. See, that's the funny and thing. I, I don't even remember people talking about it or playing it when I was in high school. Like, I don't remember having any friends who played it or knew what it was. That's what I mean. Like, if I had a friend who talked about it, I'd be like, oh, that's where I learned it from. I, 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 li- I literally don't remember anyone ever referencing or talking about D&D in any capacity. It just entered my mind via cultural osmosis. Like, it's weird. It's such a weird... It really... It kind of almost bothers me a little bit because I want to know how I found out about it, but there's no way for me to know. I'll never get that information. Just lost media. It's just there. It just popped into my brain. It's It's crazy. It's such a crazy... Like... I remember in college how I got back into it and how I played Dungeon World and stuff and that that revitalized my interest. But I don't remember that initial set setup and Sam doesn't either, which is so funny. So, I don't anyway. I don't know how we got on this topic, but yeah. That was I don't remember thing. now either to be honest. I, yeah, I don't remember how we got here, but yeah. Uh, but worth a question. Do you adhere to a strict outline for session 0? You do it the same way every time. Is there you use it for certain situations, maybe certain parties? Hmm. Um. Adhere to a strict outline. No, I don't think so. I, I there's a couple of. Oh, I'm trying to think, man. That. Hmm. A good point. No, I think what I do is there's a couple of key uh, points I always bring up, which is stuff like style of game, tone of the campaign. What I will say, actually, one thing I definitely always bring up is what kind of cultural touchstones is the game itself pulling from? So, for example, uh, I, I, another way to phrase that, I always have a sales pitch for the game, which is to say, like, when I was running Blades in the Dark, I was like, oh, it's kind of like Peaky Blinders, but like an ancient Victorian thing with some mysticism pulled in there. Uh, you know, when I'm running, when I was running 
apocalypse world i was like oh it's kind of like mad max but with a really big focus on the community that your characters are in you know uh if i'm running Shadowrun, i'm like it's a cyberpunk game but with a heavy emphasis on magic and fantasy stuff built into the cyberpunk vibe you know i always have a sales pitch for the style of game and then i generally will always establish the tone of the game so i'll say like how dark it's gonna get or how lighthearted the game might be or whatever stuff like that but other than those two things i think i generally play my session zero differently based on what the game expects of me because most games these days will give you guidance on how they want session zero to work for their system so i follow that pretty i i I tend to follow that more or less you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. i follow their guidance because i think most of the time if a game is telling me how it wants session zero to be run they've probably thought about it quite a bit and so I think it's worthwhile to follow their guidance on it. But I don't have like a checklist. If that makes sense. Yeah, but pretty much same. Like, uh, you know, th- this goes into uh, something that I'll bring up in a little bit. But it's like my my uh, session zeros are very informal. You know, it's like basic world yeah. lore shit you need yeah. to know, like touchstones. So like for Hellscapes, I was like Fallout, Borderlands, Mad Max. It is like, you know, things are dark. Things are hard, but there's a lot of brevity going on because that's the only way characters cope with it, right? Is through comedy. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of like stupid jokes going on in bad situations because characters are just really good at gallows humor, pretty much. Right, right. Um stuff like that and you know again it's like uh things to expect like with lancer i you know it's a little difficult because none of my players with the exception of of one and a half as brett has watched half of a gundam show (laughs) um and then paladin watched gurren lagon and like iron blood orphans and a couple like mechas but is not like really in tune with it everyone else shot in the dark um I'm going to have to pull a lot, a lot of heavy lifting in session zero to really break things down in a digestible way. And I'm trying to figure that out. And I think that's probably going to be about as formalized as it's going to get. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, and I, th- I, I, I talked about this actually when we talked about the like the, the safety tools episode. I think the session zero stuff works best. Like, the kind of vibe I want for my Session Zero is I want it to feel like you're going out to the bar to, like, hang out with the boys for a couple of hours just because. Like, that's the vibe I want. That's, like, the uh, that's the that's the tone I want to set. I want it to feel really chill. I want it to feel real casual. We're talking about the game a little bit. We're also talking about random nonsense, like what fucking anime we've been watching or whatever, or what video game we're playing. Because my objective with Session Zero is to make... I want the comfort level to be so strong that it feels like anything that might come up in game that feels a little awkward or uncomfortable, you're okay as a player saying something to me because we established a good camaraderie in session zero, right? You're, to, to use the bar analogy, you're hanging out with some friends at the bar and you're two, three drinks deep you're more willing this is this is probably more true of men than women i'm gonna be honest (laughs) but you know because women talk about things more openly than men do uh but (laughs) we don't need to get into that um you're hanging out at the bar and you're two or three drinks deep and because you're two or three three drinks deep suddenly one of your homies starts talking about how his relationship is going a little rough and how like 
him and his girlfriend have been having issues about, you know, the the car or house payments or rent or something. And you're more willing to talk about that kind of thing because you established that comfortable atmosphere. So you're more willing to bring that kind of heavier stuff up. I want session zero to establish that same atmosphere so that when the campaign, because inevitably it's going to enter a space of like, you went a little too far or something got a little weird or you did something a player didn't like, you're going to hit that point almost without fail because it's kind of hard not to. I want the, uh, the atmosphere to be comfortable enough that when that does happen, you can very casually discuss it and it doesn't feel awkward. I don't want it to feel like a formal. I don't want to feel like you're going to the doctor. I want it to feel like you're going to your friend's house and sitting down at their kitchen table and just chatting about stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, if something happens that you don't like, you want your player to be like, hey, man, just real quick. I, I, I wasn't really vibing with that. Thing. Yeah. I just want to let you know. Yeah. You don't you, want it to be like, and you did something wrong. That's yeah. Not, because yeah. It, it shouldn't feel like a therapy session, it, at least for me. I don't, I don't know. Maybe some people want it to feel like that. I don't know. But for me, I don't want it to feel like a therapy session. I want it to feel like a very casual chat. You and your friend went to the bar. You're sitting there. You're 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 do to doing around. Nothing's going on. You're like, and, you know, there's a moment of silence. And you go, can I just can I ask you about something real quick? And you go, yeah, yeah, sure. What's up? You know, like, that's the kind of vibe I want. Because, yeah. and you know, is that because I'm a dude? Is it because I'm a male? I'm a cisgendered heterosexual male? Maybe that might be how I am with things because of that. Yes, that might be true. But either way, that's the kind of atmosphere I like. So, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, very fair. I mean, there's well, a, well, th- so there's a funny thing I was listening to, um, I was listening to a podcast uh, where it, it, it's hosted by a, a sociologist and an economist, and um, they were talking about. Oh man, what was it? I, I forget exactly what the context of the the conversation was, but they were talking about uh, like how men and women share share their feelings and stuff, and go to therapy and so on and so forth. And they were talking about how there was an experiment done, and I. This was forever ago, so I'm sorry I can't cite any sources or anything right now. But they were like, "My sources that I made it the fuck up." No, I didn't make it the fuck up. I just can't. I just can't remember exactly what the study was. But they were basically <laughs> saying how um, men men often do not want to talk about something directly, right? So if you get a guy and a guy who have an issue, and you sit them down in a room and make them talk to each other with nothing else around, they don't want to do it. But they will do it if you give them something to do between them. So the example they gave is they had a bunch of guys come in to like fix a car or fix a broken lawnmower. And while they were fixing the car or the lawnmower, they would talk to each other about really heavy topics well, they were fixing the broken thing. And the idea is that men have this thing where we'll talk about stuff only if there's a little bit of a barrier between us and that barrier feels like a safety net. So like you're sitting there fixing the carburetor on your lawnmower and then you say to your buddy, you're like, you know, man, I just... I don't know what to do. The wife's been really mad at me and like we haven't had sex in like months and months and the and, and she's fighting with the kids all the time and I feel like it's my fault, you know. But you're only going to do that if there's like a project in between. And I don't know what that says about like heterosexual men, <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of how I think about the session zero vibe, right? Because the game, the tabletop game is that thing in between us that then uh, nobody can see this, but I'm making a lot of hand gestures right now (laughs) to to illustrate my point. But like the game is that thing between us that allows us to talk casually about the issues we're having. You know what I'm saying? Does this make sense? 
You 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 you, you feel me? Yeah, my, I I'm sorry. I I must have hit mute. Thank God I caught that early on because yeah, yeah. that would have been real bad otherwise. But you know what I mean? Yes. No, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. Mean, so for me, maybe it's because I'm not a heterosexual. Not a heterosexual <laughs> man. Yeah. I, <laughs> I've I have not had this problem typically. Like if something's bothering me, I prefer to just say it because I I I've been right. in a situation. Right. No, where, I get that. You know, friends don't talk about their problems, and then something. Then you have to. It doesn't have to regard them. It can just be a like vaguely related. Someone blows right, right. up, and then you know, eventually you're like, "Well, this doesn't feel earned." Like, how? What? What did I do? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I try to avoid that pretty much. So I, I, I like to just if something's on my mind, I'll just talk about it. Well, so to but give, no, I, I, I understand the desire to like. Nah, I'm just gonna not. <laughs> well, it's just. It, <sighs> It's just that little bit of a buffer that makes things feel slightly more. I mean, to give you an example, this is maybe getting a little too deep, but nine times out of 10, anytime I've had a sort of heavy conversation with my dad, it is when we are working on my car. <laughs> so like... There's a thing there like, you know, I have an older car and so often whenever something breaks down, I call my dad so he can come and help me fix it because most of the time we work on, you know, to save basically to save money, we work on it ourselves. Most of the like more intense conversations I've had with my father have been around fixing my car or working on something around the house or something like that. So, like, there's definitely a thing there, and I don't know what it is, but what I do know is that that energy is what I try to have in a session zero, and by establishing that in a session zero, I hope that that will keep a through line through the entire campaign so that when things come up, the game again can be used as that little bit of a buffer space to talk about the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I know. Like, I totally do. There's um, a system. Funny, my dad is. <laughs> there's uh, a system. I'm too. like that with my dad. It, well, sorry. My dad's more like that with me. Like he'll get right. heavy when we're in the car driving somewhere. Like, that's if we're on, like, another a long good. Drive, yes. Yes. That's, that's another. He'll like he'll, he'll say something, and I'll just be like, I, you know, it's that like, oh. Uh -huh. We're doing this. Okay, let me just let me straighten up real quick. Right. All right. Because the because the driving, the driving and the looking at the GPS and the changing the music every once in a while, that's the buffer, right? That's that little bit of a barrier to just keep you feel just comfortable enough. It's a weird thing. This is a strange phenomenon. I don't know how to explain it, but it's absolutely a thing. And I guarantee women are definitely listening to this and being like, are you guys okay? <laughs> <laughs> and like yes we're fine I, this is just a thing I can't explain it it's a thing I don't know where we're at with this rabbit hole but yeah uh, it's fine I mean point being I guess this the, the, all of this <laughs> all of this is to say my grand scheme for how I handle session zero is to try and exist within that space to bring it back to, yes. the, to the point <laughs> uh, and all of that is to say because it's kind of interesting. It goes into this. Is there a correct way for session zero to be held? No, not really. No, fuck um, no, not at all. No, no, not even, not even it, a little bit. Just, There's no correct way. No, the, there, there is an incorrect way to do it. And there's really only one. As long as you aren't willfully withholding information from the players that they should know. If the berserk thing is going to happen and it's not, and, and look, I totally get it. If you're in like the heat of a moment and something gets really, you just get this spur of the moment thing and things get really dark and you didn't really plan on it. You feel bad because, you know, you didn't really think about the consequences of that thing until it happened and everyone was really comfortable. That's okay, man. It happens. It does. It happens. You know, you weren't thinking about it and it happened. As long as you just own up to it, your players will 99% of the time be like, all right, man, just don't do it again. And if you won't, you don't. Everything's cool. But if you willfully know that the eclipse is going to happen and it's going to involve a player character and you don't tell them, that is wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, so that's that, very, very wrong. I mean, yeah, that's basic. I mean, you're, you're kind of reinforcing what I was saying, right? Because you were like, 
the, the example you just gave of, oh, it's cool, whatever, man, like, it's fine, just don't do it again. That's that atmosphere of comfortableness that you're willing to say that. But, yeah, if you basically don't, I guess, don't go out of your way to push the envelope, like, don't push the envelope on purpose because then that feels shitty because if you push the envelope on purpose it feels like you are targeting the player on purpose like the a, a player should not feel like you're bullying them directly because that's where things get ugly you know you it's yeah because if you're attacking if you fuck up and throw something in the game that made somebody uncomfortable you know that's one thing if you're coming after a player directly, who that's 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 you probably bad. shouldn't be GMing. <laughs> Either you shouldn't be GMing or you have some sort of beef with that player and you need to work that out in a separate scenario. You need to talk to them as a human being alone, separate from everything else. Like yeah, you can't don't use the don't use the game as your ammo to fire against them, right? Like the game should not be a weapon to bludgeon your players with because that's when it gets really ugly. That's like, yeah. you know, for, for example, if you're, you know, I know a lot of, I, I know a lot of game masters out there are, you know, uh, single and depressed, but <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but like, if you're in a game, oh, couldn't be me. <laughs> if you're in a game with like your ex girlfriend, for example, and you start using the game to bully your ex girlfriend because you're mad at her, that's the kind of shit where it's like, no, 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 no. You can't be doing that's that's way too fucked up. Like that's not big no no. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you can be mad at her, you can have your beef, but if you are keeping her in the campaign and you both agree that you're going to keep playing, then do not use the game as a weapon against that person. Like that's where the really fucked up shit happens. So yeah, as, as I said, if the eclipse situation in Berserk happens to a player character directly because you're trying to really come after that player... Yeah, no, that's now you're just being a shitty human being. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have deeply crossed the line. <laughs> not that I don't uh, know. I, I mean, not that anyone. I don't know. Do we really need to tell anyone that? Maybe not. But yeah. Well, what do I always say? Right. Codify things. <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah. Don't be a shitty GM and attack your players. Yeah. Don't uh, don't don't personally ad hominem. Come after somebody. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we are actually almost done. We're, I'm on to the last one. And this is where uh, you and I might disagree. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, how much of the character creation process do you think the players should have done before session zero? Is this like, so are you saying ideal scenario? What would you prefer? Prefer. Um... Like on a scale of my character's built, character sheet is finished, to they have a name. <laughs> uh-huh. Where where do you sit on that? So this will vary for me based on the game a little bit. Um But because different systems I think will ask different things of a player in a sort of session zero esque context. Um, but I think ideally most of the time, because I'm a, as a GM, I prefer games, you know, I, as I've said many times, Apocalypse World is my favorite system. I prefer games that are fiction first, you know, sort of more, f uh, narrative forward, less mechanics forward. So uh, Pathfinder and D&D I would describe as a mechanics first game whereas something like an Apocalypse World or Blades in the Dark I would describe as a fiction first game because I prefer the fiction first games I want 
you to come to session zero zero what <laughs> zero um i want you to come to session zero with minimal minimal concept like a name a sort of general idea a direction you might want your player to go in stuff like that but i don't want you to have anything hard locked in because i think session zero is the time where you will lock stuff down better and i think it's more effective like i think it's better if you come to a game and you're like you know to use DD as an example uh this is my race and my class that i'm thinking about possibly playing and like this is the general idea for my character he's a you know he's a, a a mighty warrior whose family was killed by an evil cult and he seeks vengeance and like that's the basic premise that's about as far as i want you to go generally because uh nailing down the specifics is the kind of thing I want to do with you as the GM because I have more fun for me it's more fun as a GM to nail down the specifics with you as a player than it is for you to come to the table with a bunch of decisions already made and me have to try and fit them into my game I think it's more fun if we can work those out together because i have one idea you have two, one idea and then we find this interesting amalgamation of the two ideas i think that's more fun so to give an example again to go back to descent into avernus you know you had a specific idea for your character as this warlock blood hunter thing who served one of the devils and then you're like, well, I kind of want to be like this evil character who maybe like serves a devil or is from hell or something like that. Right. And then Sam, as the GM came back, he was like, OK, what if you serve this devil and you were trying to go to hell for this specific purpose? You know, he like nailed down the specifics with you. That I think is just kind of <laughs> kind of like I, I know it's not exactly. Do you want to know how that actually went with Sam? I'll I, tell you. There was a back and forth is my point. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, there, there was, but it was really, so I was, you know, he would talk about Avernus, I thought about it for a couple days, and I sent him a text, and I was like, I kind of want to play an evil character, and he was like, I was uh -huh. just about to text you and ask if you want to play a devil character, and I was like, hmm, I see, it's good to know that we're in the same right. mindset here, and he was like, alright, what do you think, and I was like, okay, like, bounty hunter for a devil lord, he's like, alright, bet, do you want one of the, uh, the, the hell charms, and I was like, bet, like, it just yeah but it that's was just the, like it was literally <laughs> the light they wrote down yeah but that's what i mean right like you worked the sp so like you had an idea you're like i kind of want to play an evil character who's like kind of a bounty hunter and then sam said okay what about this and this oh yeah that sounds like a cool idea okay cool let's go with that do you want one of the devil charms yeah okay let's get one of the devil charms right you had a general and then Sam tweaked the specific dials and then you nailed it down. And what you got was a character who was really deeply tied into the campaign. And Sam had fun with the scenario because he got to add in world building stuff to your character. And you had fun because you got to play the character, the character you wanted. So... That's the kind of scenario I want. I want you to have some broad ideas about I want to do this and then that. And then I want the GM to be like, OK, what if we did a little bit of this and a little bit of that and add a little bing, bing, boom. All right, cool. Now we have the specifics. So I guess I I guess long, long, long answer short. I want the characters, the players to come with pretty minimal details that are open for adjustments. Mm hmm. Right? I think that's the, okay. that's the long and short of it. No, I mean, that's good. Like, so to, to, to contrast, um, when you describe it like that, pretty much same. So like I've been working with, with two of my players, um, and session zero is on the 30th, hating the shit out of this episode. Um, <laughs> session zero is on the 30th. And I've been, I've been going around to people, you know, who I, I went to these characters, these players first, because I know they're, they're like the OC makers. And I was like, yep. Yeah, you too. Mm. I can. Uh -huh. 
I can get the work done with you guys now and then worry about everybody else later, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and I mean, that's a thing, too, right? Knowing what kind of players have what kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, Snubby, her character's done, basically. She gave me a concept. I gave her feedback. She refined, gave me this, gave her feedback. She was like, I want this thing. And I was like, okay, you want a companion? What do you got? And then she gave me something and I gave her feedback. Like, it's just been a nonstop back and forth for the last week and a half. Um, and her character's done. And she she roughed out her character sheet on on the, the, the companion app. Um, it's 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 rough, like in so far as like there's things that don't quite go where they're supposed to go. So that there will still be some back and forthing on that as well. Right. But she's basically done. And I'm pretty much I'm like, good. I hands like, you know, dusted hands off. Fantastic. But other players, I know I'm going to get a proper noun, like their name, mm-hmm. um, you know, basic idea of a of funny robot and like maybe name for funny robot, hopefully a planet or a space station that they're from. Um, I'm trying to push because this happens. It's, it keeps happening, right? Mm-hmm. What happened in the last game? The characters who give me more get more out of it, right? Because I can prepare of characters course. for them. I can prepare areas, enemies, yeah, uh, custom gear, yeah, fun little backstory stuff. Like, yeah, of course. If, if, if you're you, gonna get what you put in, yeah, if you put the and work in, not, your GM can reciprocate the work. Yeah, yeah, of course. And it's it's funny because I often will give you more than you put in. Give me anything, and I will make something out of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Snubby's last character, the one that died, at the right before the character died, was like, oh yeah, you know, he has these three siblings, and these are their here's like some art I made of them, and here's so they're like rough personalities. Oh, they just became part of the team after the character died. Because they they just developed so much as characters. You know, they had their likes, dislikes, um, you know, they bounced off of each other really well. And I don't even mean through like roleplay. I mean like mechanically in like, you know, ca- characters would go to one character because they were more like maternal. They would go to the other because they were, you know, it, and this was on purpose, like an attempt to be the character that died because, you know, that's the younger brother. He wants to replicate his older brother. Uh, and then the, the youngest one was the pragmatic, you know, kind of child prodigy character that they went to for um, like intelligence based questions. You know, like like the 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 oldest sister, wise but not quite smart. The other one, conf- uh, you know, brave but not quite wise. And the youngest one was smart but not quite wise. Um. So they they it, you know the characters would go to them for different shit basically, and it was it was really fun. I got that out of basic description, names, and art. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can you can often pull a lot out of not that much. It it doesn't take a ton. You know, it, it often just takes one little kernel of inspiration to just keep pulling on. Like I said, give your GM a thread to pull on so you can keep pulling and pulling. Um, but I, I would, you know, ideally, I would like a little bit more than like, here is my name and here is my class. Like, give me a little bit more than that. You know what I mean? Yes, please. God. Yeah. Like there, there is a little bit of a fine line. Like, I don't want you to get too specific because as I said, if you get too specific, it makes it difficult for me as a GM to work with you. It's more fun if, if you give me the general and then I dial in the specifics with you. Um, but don't be so broad in general that I just have nothing to work with. That's not... You know, there's a, there's a happy medium for sure, which is kind of why stuff like the amnesia character is really difficult to work with because that's so broad, vague, and general that I'm like, okay, what the fuck do I want to do with this here? You know what I mean? Correct. <laughs> yeah, I know you had to deal with that. I know. Um, that's why. It's if, fine. I turned him into Solid Snake by the end. <laughs> I mean, sure, that works. It, that's right, big boss. Uh, it scarred him, shot out his eye. Oh yeah. yeah. Full, full punish venom snake treatment. Nice. Uh, that's why if I were to ever do the amnesia character, I would make sure there was some little, 
little tidbit that sort of tied me to the rest of the situation, even if my character doesn't know it. You know what I mean? Like the character can be entirely oblivious as long as you as the player give your GM a little something to work with, you know? Mm. And it again doesn't have to be a lot. Just needs to be a little something, something. A little spice, a little, a little, just, you know, a margarita is good. But a margarita with salt on the rim really takes it to the next level. You know what I'm saying? It's that you know little what takes something. that to a next level? What? Chili garnish. I don't Chili know. powder on the rim rather than salt. All right, real shit. Mwah. All right, real shit. So the, the, that place we went to in Beacon a little while ago. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I like the chili garnish thing that much. I'm going to be honest. Oh, I don't know. If hurts it, me deeply. I just really like margarita salt. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. The chili garnish is not, it's definitely not, it's good. But I think I like just regular salt better. It hurts me. It hurts me so deep. Hey, can we agree? I literally, I, I, my, can we agree yeah. though that the sugar on the rim are heathens? Just a, it doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't, doesn't offset do it. anything. It doesn't the whole do point anything. of the it salt is to it, offset the like I know, I know. battery I know. acid flavor of the tequila. I know. What? All right, I no, know. Th- th- we're, sh- this is two people who've been bartenders. <laughs> King, we can't do this. So I know. I understand. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. The, sh- the salt, or sorry, the sugar on the rib does nothing. I. What are you doing? Stop it. Madness. Animal. Animal. I, I know. Pre- correction. I've, I've never been a personal. I've, I've bar backed for a couple, like, for like six months you, and then you, did some personal you're bartending hob- stuff. You, you are you know a I mean? bartender. Yes. 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 He is working as a bartender. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do work as a bartender. But yeah, point still stands. Anyway. <laughs> it's like yeah it's a whole thing anyway um yeah i don't know maybe it's because i'm white i don't fuck with the chili as much i don't know <laughs> i you know what admittance is a strong ability it, it <laughs> so might self-awareness be. is a superpower <laughs> it might be it might be why i don't know oh uh, but uh yeah that's pretty much all i had um and i think we did pretty good I mean, we yapped for long enough. That's for sure. We did, but like, I, like, I don't know. I think for for our, you know, friends who might be like, oh, DMing is hard. I feel like this is a pretty consensive way of, of sort of giving them information about session zero. Anyone who might be watching, like a, a, a sort of not dumbed down, but a, a you know, a, a no bullshit. Here are some examples, kind of way of doing session zero. You know, it's funny. Not quite video essay, but. Yeah, not quite video essay, but almost. Um, It's funny you say that, actually, because I didn't even think about this until until you just mentioned it, but Session Zero, people who feel like DMing, you know, who have that mentality of, like, DMing is really hard. I do think Session Zero can actually be a pretty good tool to make that fear, to kind of assuage that fear, because... What Session Zero often does is get you really excited for the game, just in general. And if you're nervous or feel like DMing is going to be really hard, but you have a really good Session Zero, it it will take you from that nervous space to like, all right, well, I'm still a little nervous, but now I'm kind of hyped, you know? There's like a there's Bro, like, I can't even tell you how fucking hype I am for my session zero. I'm literally yeah. like I have been texting people like, do you have anything yet? Can I help you make anything yeah. with this character? Do you did your robot have a name? Well, did you name the robot yet? <laughs> you should. <laughs> well, I think because what session zero really does is it it makes you um session zero is is like I was saying before, it's casual enough that everybody feels like they're just kind of chilling, hanging out. But if you do it right, it ha- it is productive enough that you get sort of excited for what's to come. It's like, you know, it's like the perfect kind of business meeting. You're like, you're not too stressed out, but you feel like it was a good enough meeting. You're like, okay, we can do something with this. We can get something done here. So if you do it right, yeah, you'll, you'll come out of it being more excited and then DMing will sort of feel less intimidating in a way because you're excited Mm -hmm. so yeah i didn't i didn't even consider that aspect of it until you just mentioned it but yeah that that feels like a thing well that's a big thing i feel like for for starting dms right is the second you like until you're used to doing it regularly and until you're used to being able to do it if even if you don't really want to that day you know like (laughs) once you build a routine it's fine but 
right, when you're right. starting out, if losing hype can kill the campaign. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, a, a, a lack of a lack of desire, like not feeling particularly interested in anything, like not feeling like the idea is that strong will definitely kill a campaign. And yeah, having a good session zero is how you make the idea strong most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. What a what a what a shitty place that can often be though, where you're like, oh, I'm just not that interested in this game anymore. I don't know what to do now. I haven't been in that situation. I've been in that situation as a player for sure. Um, I haven't been that way as a DM. I was in that way uh, for our last game. I could tell toward the end. Yeah, I could tell. Not even a, a little bit towards the end, but particularly there was a there was a middle chunk there where I was really like, "Oh, what the fuck am I doing?" It's when we were in the wastes, right? Yeah. Um, it was sort of, uh, it was sort of like that into the meeting Zeus into the, into the manatide stuff. Like there was some. I felt like I had some ideas, but I was sort of faffing about, not sure what to do with them. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. But that, I think, was partially because of 5e as a system I was getting frustrated with rather than, like, the campaign necessarily itself. Yeah, I could see, like, fatigue with a system. That's fair. Yeah, I definitely felt fatigue with 5e as a system. But that's not here or there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any last minute thoughts? No, I don't know. I mean, I guess the main takeaway is, you know, kind of like we established session zero. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong way to do it, but you should try and make it as comfortable for you as possible. Right. I think that's kind of the best takeaway. Yeah, for for both DMs and players, you want to make, you know, it, th- there's going to be session one awkwardness always, right? You don't yeah, know the characters, sure. you don't really like, especially if you and if you don't play with each other often, you don't really, you might not know each other. Session zero helps you familiarize yourself with system characters and players and the GM if they're new as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, the, yeah, you can't avoid the session one awkwardness. But the session, the session one awkwardness is easier to get through if you have a productive session zero. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, that's a. Uh, yeah. Uh, find us in the, the doobly doo of the episode where you can see other places for the episode. Uh, follow us on Twitter. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, watch Berserk, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, or read Berserk? Question. Well, the movies fuck. I stand by this. Yeah, yeah. The movies, the movies of the Golden Ark are good, for sure, definitely. Yeah. After that, you experience get- Berserk some way, shape, or form, and just you know, if for no other reason, watch 2016 and 2017 Berserk because the soundtrack fucks. <laughs> the soundtrack does fuck. <laughs> God damn. All right, y'all. That all with us. That's, that all is us. Yeah. <laughs> I said it, I'm sticking with it. I don't know.